All right, we are here at day three of ALA's 2020 conference. This is the first time ALA University is providing these conferences virtually online. I'm watching these videos and then I'm taking the things that I found most helpful and sharing it with you. Now as a quick disclaimer, these are my opinions. Even though I am an ALA member, the opinions expressed in this video cannot be contributed to ALA organization as a whole, nor can they even be contributed to the speakers themselves. These are what I took out of the video and what I'm sharing, what I thought they say. You can totally download the entire entire video and watch it from Ayla University yourself and you can fact check what I'm saying. Now today's track are all related to removal proceedings and litigation. It is the hottest trend in immigration right now because the administration has been strongly opposed to anything immigration related. So the only way to challenge it is through the courts. There's a lot of good topics here and I can't wait to get started. All right, here we are. Day three, session five, litigating in the new age of deference. Now, Another title could be how to win a mandamus or APA lawsuit against USCIS. This is a great video that directly follows the previous litigation videos that we made because it directly tackles the deference issue that we didn't discuss. And who better to present these topics than these speakers over here, Ayla authors, speakers, thinkers, some of the best in the industry. I can't wait to dive into it with you. Let's get started. Now, as a quick background, when you're suing the government or you're suing USCIS because your case got denied or delayed, you're using mandamus or APA as a ground. And the government has great latitude of discretion when they adjudicate these cases. They can't just be sued left and right by everybody who has a unfavorable outcome. In this video, we're gonna dive in to show how their discretion has been abused and that's why the decision is null and void. Now, this is not just creative lawyering, it's based on the Supreme Court ruling in June 2019, Kilser versus Wilkie, boom. Now, it is a very tight case. It's five justices versus four justices, and it is essentially overturning the previous deference principle. Now, I said essentially because it didn't effectively overturn the deference principle. It just created five additional elements that when you are suing the government, on abuse of discretion, you really need to look at these five elements. And the public policy on both sides is quite clear. You cannot give unlimited power to different agencies to decide whatever they want and change whatever Congress decided and implement however they want. On the other hand, each agency should have their own discretion in how to implement rules to try to catch fraud, to try to make things more efficient. So what exactly is the boundary. In this new case, they essentially created five elements or factors that the judge should really consider when they are deciding if an agency really abused their discretion so that they should change their decision. Now, what does that mean to us? Well, if USCIS has been continuously denying cases and we think that they are abusing their discretion based on these five elements, we can directly take it and sue USCIS and say, hey, look at all these elements. You're clearly not executing the law according to how Congress intended. You're making up your own rules and your decision doesn't even make sense. Therefore, we should toss it out and you should approve our case. All right, let's get started. The first one is genuine ambiguity. If Congress intended your agency to have a wide latitude of discretion, they will purposely leave it ambiguous. They would not make it super clear. They would not put all these examples. They would not make their thoughts clearly known. Now, if any of you have ever read law, something that's super simple could be like 50 pages. The first 10 pages could just be definitions upon definitions, examples of definitions, and when definitions will go into play in reference to other laws with their definitions, and it could go on and on just for a very simple thing. Meaning, it is very rare for Congress to leave anything genuinely ambiguous. Now, there are certain things that can have some ambiguity, but, that's just those limited things. And we know as immigration practitioners, when you're applying for visas and over the years, things are constantly being decided and determined and interpreted by USCIS. In one year, they would approve the case based on their extraordinary ability. In another year, they will revoke it saying, nah, we changed our mind. That is kind of unacceptable. And yes, we understand the agency is not bound by their prior decisions, but the point is, if the law is clear, why are you changing your mind so much? And so your proof number one when you sue the government is to say the law is super clear, we abide by that law, we presented all these documents, and USCIS has used their own interpretation against what the law is saying and denied our case. The second point is reasonable construction. Assuming the law is ambiguous, or let's grant the USCIS or the government does have a wide latitude in interpreting this particular section of the law, is your interpretation reasonable? 
Or another way to put it, is your interpretation so restrictive that it actually cancels out the visa itself? Or it's so restrictive that it goes against the very nature and spirit of the law? Let's take L1A, the executive managers, for example. Most denials is because they don't consider the applicant to be a high level enough executive or manager. They must have you know, 50 people underneath them. The company must have $20 billion in assets. They might have $20 million in revenue or something along those lines. If USAS takes that super restrictive definition of a manager or an executive so that you have to be these leading executives from the biggest international companies, then that obviously restricts the definition of a manager, right? If you are a manager at a local McDonald's, you are still a manager. What was Congress intent of a manager? There's super low managers and there's super high managers. So under what circumstance is that interpretation correct? I won an L1A appeal case based on this reasonable construction. The government argued that the L1A did not qualify because the office was too small. It was only 100 square foot, but we argue that it was an e-commerce website and they had huge inventory and they had tons of workers working all over the world and they don't need a physical big office. And it was not reasonable for them to deny a case just purely based on the square footage of an office. So now the courts are able to look at how these agencies are executing these quote unquote ambiguous regulations to see if they are actually reasonable. And if they are not reasonable and if you can prove your case, then those cases can get reversed, it can be saved, you do it. The next issue is authority. And generally speaking, USCIS does have the authority, right? You file an application with them, it's their responsibility to adjudicate and interpret the laws. But where this may play out is if you already filed all the applications and then you're facing this local officer from this particular chapter, and then they are deciding things that's way above their pay grade. For example, if you already passed through the incredible long and arduous process of getting a citizenship, you took the test, you passed the oath, but for whatever reason, this local officer will not issue you your certificate based on some bogus reason, while well, they're definitely pulling above their weight and you can sue that officer saying, hey, you don't have the authority to do that. Number four, and this is a big one, substantive expertise. If the agency is issuing decisions that is not in their area of expertise or based on their incompetency, they shouldn't be making decisions like these, well then you can definitely challenge their decision. And this is huge because the immigration agency touches on every aspect of life, of international law, of every law in every country. It is insanely complex. For example, we touch on this on the special immigrant juvenile video we talked about earlier. And basically, the government, USCIS, is going back and challenging original decisions by the family court on whether or not a kid is actually abandoned, neglected, or abused. These family court judges specialize in dealing with kids with trauma. It is their expertise. And here you have a USCIS officer thousands of miles away in a little crappy room adjudicating this case without having to interview the kid or the witnesses. And they are directly saying, hey judge, you made this determination about abuse and neglect, but we think you're wrong. And that determination is ripe for challenging it in court because they do not have the substantive expertise to adjudicate these cases. This level of expertise really belongs in the individual courts in that specific county, in that specific state. Another example is asylum law. These USCIS officers and these immigration judges are reviewing these cases, but they do not have training in international humanitarian law and trafficking and the, 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 the disaster that these individuals are facing in foreign countries. So if your asylum application gets denied because the USCIS officer essentially writes, I don't think you're really persecuted. I don't think you'll really be harmed if you go back to your country. You can go back. I think you'll be just fine. You can totally appeal that in court now by saying, how do you know? And the list goes on and on and on. How does a USCIS officer know constitutional law about religious rights for R1 and EB1 applications? How does a USCIS officer really understand the complexity of an international merger and stocks exchange going off on Hong Kong, Shenzhen, every area of the world? How does a USCIS officer know the birth certificate regulations or regarding China before the Communist Party took into effect and before there was an empire? It's just super complex. And so on one hand, they do not have the expertise regards to all of these areas. And it is your burden as the applicant to provide them all of the documentation. And so if they deny your case based on all this indisputable documentation, then you have a right to challenge them. But then on the other hand, 
USCIS does deal with the whole world's immigration applications to the US, so they do have international expertise, and they do have resources from other agencies. And so if they are able to find something that's able to contradict you, then they, of course, have the deference. So this goes back to, it's your burden of proof as the applicant, as the lawyer representing your clients, to furnish an indisputable case that you can win with USCIS and with the courts. And number five, no surprises. I love this one because depending on the administration, a Republican, a Democrat, somebody who's pro-immigration, who's somebody who's against immigration, somebody who's a nationalist, somebody who's a globalist, depending on the vision of the top dog, USCIS as an organization seem to be changing year in and year out. In year one, this is okay. In year two, this is not okay. And now, Based on this new rule, you cannot have surprises. If you're going to change your policy, you better release a memo and it better be well-reasoned and sound. And one of the best examples of this is the lawsuit between Harvard, MIT against the Department of State and ICE, right? We made a video, Harry Potter style over here. You would do well to check it out. But basically, this is the exact argument they made. You cannot give us a surprise. You originally made a determination in March saying international students don't have to be physically in class. They can just do online classes. And then suddenly in July, you reverse that decision and saying, no, now they do have to go to online classes. Sorry, that's a huge surprise. You cannot do that. And those are the five ways you can challenge an agency determination. If you're seeing the government, if you're seeing USCIS continuously deny cases or just deny your case based on some bogus reason that you really find unsatisfying, you can now take this and use this precedent, a Supreme Court ruling, and challenge it in federal court. And I wish you the best. Please let me know your results. I would love to know about it. Thank you. Take care, bye-bye. Besides this video, we're also very active on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, and we're trying to put out content that's appropriate to those mediums. Now, if you like this video, you might like some of the things that we're posting on there as well. Feel free to engage with us there. Now, after today's session, we're also doing one more session tomorrow, and it's a really big session because we're gonna hear the big leaders and what they have to say. And then after this series is done, the ELA conference, I'm gonna go through and teach immigration law and go through every single nuance that you, would, you might want to learn. So if you like this kind of stuff, feel free to like and subscribe below. I'd love to engage with you. Thank you. Bye-bye.